Okay, well, I want to welcome everybody from around uh, the globe, uh, particularly in the United States, across Europe and Asia, to the next in a series of uh, webinar education uh, talks. Um, these are the Talking Head X. I want to encourage everyone to join the uh, American Society of Head and Neck Radiology and uh, to encourage you also to sign up for our virtual meeting, which will take place September 9th through the 13th, uh, 2020. Uh, there are a couple housekeeping issues that we want to bring uh, to your attention. Uh, use the Q&A panel to ask questions for the presenters um, following the presentation. You will see a chat box uh, that can be used to discuss and connect with your fellow attendees. If you would like to um, remove that, it can be minimized so as not to distract you. So with that, I would like uh, to also make you aware there will be CME credits available. You will uh, signed up for this. You'll get an email regarding how to uh, go ahead and, uh, and obtain those credits uh, for the talk that you're gonna be hearing today. Um, the learning objectives are uh, one, to recognize the most frequently encountered inner ear malformations. Become familiar with some pathognomonic inheritable syndromes associated with sensory neural hearing loss, and to identify traumatic and inflammatory causes of sensory neural hearing loss. And with that, I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Amy Giuliano, from the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Institute. Um, I had forgotten to introduce myself, Jack Lane, from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where winter has officially ended. And so now I'd like to turn things over to Amy, who will introduce our speaker, Kelly Robson. Amy. Thank you, Jack. Thank you so much, Christine, for organizing this amazing webinar that is just so loved and attended by so many everywhere. And um, as Jack said, I work at Mass Eye and Ear, and I trained here in Boston and specifically under Cali as well. And I'm so delighted and so honored to, ha to have the opportunity to introduce her today. So just a little bit about Cali. Um, she's the current president of the American Society of Head and Neck Radiology, and she is past president of the American Society of Pediatric Neuroradiology. She's the division chief of neuroradiology and director of head and neck imaging at Boston Children's Hospital, and she's associate professor at Harvard Medical School. <clears throat> Callie was born in Durban, South Africa, and she studied medicine there as well in the University of Cape Town. She did her radiology residency there, and she became a pediatric radiologist there as well. She came here to Boston in 1993, and she only wanted to stay two years, and we're all so happy that she did not, and she stayed, and so she's been here ever since. She did her pediatric neuroradiology fellowship at Boston Children's, and she's been there for 26 years. She subspecializes in pediatric head and neck within pediatric neuroradiology. She has about 90 or more peer-reviewed publications and 70 chapters and reviews. Callie loves the outdoors. She loves to hike. And sometimes we actually see her, run into her sometimes, hiking and swimming uh, with her husband and her three daughters. She has been such a wonderful, wonderful mentor and teacher to so many. And I'm sure so many of them are on this webinar as well. So thank you so much, Callie, to speak, for speaking to us today on sensory nerve hearing loss. And we can't wait. So while we're getting the slides up, thank you so much to Amy for that lovely introduction. I have absolutely loved working with you over the years and so enjoy our ongoing collaborations with you and your wonderful team at the Mass Eye and Ear. Thanks to Christine Glastonbury, who has been extraordinary in organizing these webinars at very short notice, in spite of her own grueling and extensive responsibilities in her home institution at UCSF. Thank you, Christine, for your energy, your dedication, and for putting this all together. And so over to Erica, who's going to bring up the talk. Thank you for joining us for this third ASHNR Talking Heads and Next webinar. Over the next 40 minutes, we will review pediatric specific imaging techniques for the evaluation of pediatric sensory neural hearing loss. We'll review a variety of congenital and acquired causes of pediatric sensory neural hearing loss 
And after this talk, you should be able to recognize any ear malformations and be familiar with some of the more pathognomonic heritable syndromes that can be identified on imaging. And lastly, to identify traumatic and inflammatory causes of sensory neural hearing loss. Now, sensory neural hearing loss and pediatric hearing loss in general is common in childhood. Approximately 1 in 1,000 children worldwide have hearing loss of greater than 40 decibels and about 2 to 3 in 1,000 children in the United States have detectable hearing loss in one or both ears. So let's start off where we ended in the last talk on conductive hearing loss now with a review of any ear anatomy and physiology. So first of all starting with cochlear structure what we see on imaging is largely the external surrounding of the cochlear and in ear structures. And then on MR, we see the fluid containing chambers of the cochlear and cochlear nerve. So just to review based on histopathological section, the cochlear has three chambers, the scala vestibuli, scala tympani, which contain the buffering perilymph. And then the cochlear duct, as seen here, or which is also known as the scala media, which contains endolymph. And the organ of corti lies upon the basilar membrane within the scala media. And this is a sensory organ consisting of about 30,000 cilia or hair cells arranged in rows. Each hair cell connects to a nerve fiber that then ultimately relays various impulses to the cochlear nerve and thence to the brain. So the physiology of sensory neural hearing is that the vibrations set in motion by the ossicles cause the cochlear fluid to essentially ripple. And this propagates as a wave along the hair cells on the basilar membrane. And as the hair cells move, the stereocilia on the hair cells bend, causing pore-like channels at the tips of the stereocilia to open. And this then results in a chemical cascade into these cells, which then in turn creates an electrical signal which is carried centrally to the brain by the auditory nerve and ultimately turned into recognizable sound. Now when it comes to imaging of the temporal bone, we have at our disposal both CT and MR. And for sensory neural hearing loss, loss, both provide information, considerable information, which is in some respects complementary. CT, of course, is the exam of choice for the assessment of conductive or mixed hearing loss. And so in order to determine which modality is best, one needs to take in consideration whether sedation will be required. So for example, nowadays using our multi-slash CT units, we can very quickly acquire images and avoid sedation in many children. Those images are then viewed at 0.625 millimeter increments with reformats constructed parallel to the plane of the hard palate, which also happens to be parallel to the plane of the horizontal semicircular canal. Coronal images ideally are perpendicular to the plane of the hard palate and semi horizontal semicircular canal. We do also acquire oblique reformats. Short reformats, short axis reformats are parallel to the plane of the superior semicircular canal as depicted here. And these reformats are used not only to assess the integrity of the bone overlying the superior semicircular canal, but it, they also depict the entire course of the vestibular aqueduct, which is seen sequentially on axial images and can be seen beautifully on these short axis reformats and more accurately measured. For MR, the pediatric protocol differs from that used in older patients. So for children suspected of having congenital hearing loss, we don't administer contrast. We acquire heavily 3D T2 weighted images. The name of the sequence will depend on your unit. And in our institution, we acquire these images on a 3T system. And the idea in, on MR is that you see the fluid within the various uh, scalar chambers. And also, MR is used to depict the seventh and eighth cranial nerves and the branching structures of the vestibular cochlear nerve. As you see here, the diverging anterior cochlear nerve and the posterior and inferior, inferior vestibular nerve. Now we also directly acquire, or potentially one can reformat these images, um, oblique sagittals, which are at right angles to the plane of the cochlear nerve 
And these demonstrate a cross-section of the internal auditory meatus, whereby four cranial nerves are seen at the midpoint of the IAC, with the facial nerve located anteriorly and superiorly, the cochlear nerve anteriorly and inferiorly, remember seven up, coke down, and then posteriorly the diverging vestibular nerves. So this technique is used for evaluation, for example, of cochlear implant candidates. And then for those children suspected of having acquired sensory neural hearing loss, for those patients, contrast will then be given and fat suppressed T1-weighted images will be acquired. Increasingly, we do try whenever possible to obtain our MR exams without sedation um, using various distraction techniques and evening napping appointments. So the goals of imaging are to try and identify structural causes of hearing loss, which are found in up to a third of patients with sensory neural hearing loss. Whenever possible to provide a guide to genetic testing by diagnosing a syndrome when possible and providing information that is used for parental counseling. MR and CT are also very important in defining preoperative anatomy and helping to guide surgery. So for example, both modalities help determine whether the patient is a surgical candidate. For example, if the cochlea is too small, it may not accept the array. If the cochlear nerve is absent, that may be a contraindication. And CT in particular is useful for looking for anatomic risk factors, such as aberrancy of the seventh cranial nerve, and then also those conditions associated with deficiency of the internal structure of the cochlea, which are then at risk of a CSF gusher at the time of cochleotomy. And imaging is also used to help determine the most appropriate side and timing for cochlear implant in those patients with post-meningetic cochlear ossification or cochlear ossification from other causes. Now, when it comes to hearing loss at birth, about half to two thirds of cases are thought to be genetic in origin. And of these, one third have attributable syndromic etiologies. And of those, which are both genetic and syndromic, these are the ones outlined here that have very pathognomonic imaging findings. But the majority of genetic causes are non-syndromic where the temporal bone is the only afflicted organ. And of these, the most common entity is an autosomal recessive inherited connexin 26 mutation. And most patients with that mutation do not have abnormal imaging. Now, when it comes to what we see on imaging, CT demonstrates the very dense appearing otic capsule bone which houses the inner ear structures and the cochlea with two and a half to two and three quarter turns. The bone between each turn is known as the interscalar septum and it is relatively robust between the basal and middle turn and relatively gracile between the middle and apical turn. At the level of the cochlear aperture at the fundus of the IAC, notice this box or bow tie shaped medialis and symmetric scalar chambers on each side of the medialis. And a normal cochlear aperture should be at least greater than 1.6, 1.7 millimeters in diameter. You also see vestibule, semicircular canals, and the vestibular aqueduct. MR, as mentioned, shows you the fluid components of the cochlear, vestibule, and semicircular canals. And you can see the endoscalar septum. And then within the center of each turn, notice a very thin ossific line, which is the osseous spiral lamina. So the osseous spiral lamina is also seen within the basal turn on CT. It's a very thin structure and should be barely appreciable. And on MR, it can also be seen in the middle and apical turns. Here are the nerves as we discussed earlier. So this is the first example that I will show of a positive imaging finding in a patient with congenital bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. CT demonstrates enlargement of the vestibular aqueduct. And correspondingly, MR shows an enlarged endolymphatic sac and duct nestled behind the dural reflection. And if you look carefully at the cochlea compared with normal, you can see deficiency of the interscalar septum between the apical and middle turns, which appear abnormally plump. And in fact, the medialis is also absent in this case. And notice the smooth outer surface posteriorly. This is known as cochlear incomplete partition type 2.
Notice the course of the enlarged vestibular aqueduct well depicted on the short axis oblique. So here are the features as shown in the preceding slide. And when you see complete absence of the medialis together with the incomplete partition abnormality, these patients are at potential risk of CSF leak at the time of cochleotomy because CSF gets from the posterior fossa subarachnoid space into the perilymph space resulting in perilymph high drops with increased pressure. Now this entity has been widely discussed in the literature dating back to the original report from 1791 from Carlo Mondini who performed an autopsy on a young boy who was run over who had been deaf in his life and Mondini described enlargement of the endolymphatic sac and duct as well as the cochlear anomaly. And then in 1978, Galdino Valvasore and Jack Clemis described conventional tomographic findings of the same entity. And our knowledge has grown over the years so that now we understand that there is an associated genetic mutation in these cases. And similarly, there has been a lot written in our radiology literature, including the Cincinnati criteria, which give us now definite measurements. They determine that a midpoint measurement should be less than one millimeter in diameter to be normal. So one or greater is abnormal. And they also determine that the normal vestibular aqueduct opercular measurement should be less than two millimeters. Although in actual fact, there does seem to be a gray zone where we do observe patients with an upper limit of normal midpoint measurement and an opercular measurement between one to two millimeters who, who do seem to have underlying genetic mutations, hearing loss, and quickly incomplete partition type two anomalies. As mentioned in the reports from Berkshire Osgen, Amy Giuliano, and Hugh Curtin and colleagues, if you're going to really accurately measure the vestibular aqueduct, you should do so on the short axis reformats. More recently, there have been some wonderful articles outlining how to detect the cochlear anomalies associated with enlargement of the vestibular aqueduct on MR. Much easier to determine that there's incomplete partition on CT. And on, on MR, it's a little confusing because the osseous spiral lamina can become bowed and can resemble the interscalar septum. So they've also provided measurements for determining the angle between the apical and middle turns and you'll see flattening um, with incomplete partition type 2 anomalies or the milder variants of that. So again, here is the index case and here are some examples. So when you see enlargement of the vestibular aqueduct, the cochlear anomalies can range from this appearance of a flagrant IP2 to milder more subtle anomalies of the cochlear medialis. So compare the normal structure of the medialis with this medialis and this patient here. These are asymmetric modialar, modialar in patients with uh, large endolymphatic sacs. So what are the clinical consequences of detecting enlargement of the vestibular aqueduct? Well, this is a congenital lesion which has delayed onset, tends to fluctuate, but will usually progress over time. Sensory neural hearing loss can become dramatically worse after apparently mild trauma. So the parents are advised to have their kids avoid contact sports. Some patients have mild vestibular symptoms and up to 40% of patients have an underlying genetic mutation either as part of a familial manifestation or as a spontaneous mutation. When the ear is the only involved organ, then the condition is termed non-syndromic large vestibular aqueduct, also known as DFNB4. And when there is an associated thyroid hormone dyshormogenesis, then the patient is said to have Pendred syndrome. So when we see this anomaly on imaging, the patients then undergo evaluation of thyroid hormones and the parents are counseled again about the avoiding contact sports. So now what of other in the ear malformations? Well, there are a wide variety of them. And so let's look at some other examples. And these range from very rare anomalies such as complete labyrinthine aplasia to primitive and also unusual anomalies such as an otocyst where there's just a small rounded structure which resembles a little vestige of the developing vestibule and cochlea. 
to a cochlea which is defined and present but is too small, hypoplasia, to the three types of partition abnormality. Now this is descriptive terminology where IP1 des describes a cochlea which lacks internal structure. IP2 is a term reserved for that entity affecting the middle and apical turns associated with large vestibular aqueduct in most cases. And IP3 is a very specific entity where the cochlea not only lacks internal structure, but has this very bizarre corkscrew type morphology, and we'll talk about this in a moment. What is the clinical relevance of this descriptive classification? The first few examples, the cochlea is usually too small, and the cochlear nerve is typically, so well, I should say, too small or absent, and the cochlear nerve is typically absent as well. And as we move along these anomalies, cochlear hypoplasia, variable hypoplasia or aplasia of the cochlear nerve, to the last three, where the cochlear turns are abnormally plump and the internal structure is deficient, and these harbor the potential of a risk of CSF leak at the time of cochleotomy. So now what are the classification of any ear malformations? Well, this has also evolved over the year, and most of us really like and use the Senoroglu classification. Dr. Senoroglu is an ENT surgeon and he looked at all of his teaching files and he generated a descriptive classification. But what he did when he described these anomalies was he put some clinical relevance and applicability into it. And more recently, he has revised his classification and expanded it as seen in this article from 2017. And he describes these malformations into inner ear for malformations and cochlear nerve abnormalities. And there are at least nine categories of inner ear malformations, with the most severe one here, complete labyrinthine aplasia, to the more milder abnormalities as seen here. One other thing of interest is that in the past, we used to describe these anomalies according to the timing of the, gene of the insult in gestation, and it was thought that these really severe anomalies occurred very early in gestation, whereas these other ones occurred after a lot of the structure had formed. And whilst this is in some respect true, we now recognize the genetic underpinnings of a number of these abnormalities. And so things are a little bit more complicated than just an insult being timed at a certain time during gestation. So let's look at some more examples. This is known as a common cavity type of malformation. And this entity here I call a cystic cochlear vestibular anomalies both structures have a lack of the usual structure. They look rather enlarged. There is variable either communication with an IAC or lack of communication with an IAC. And when there is no communication and the IAC is small, then invariably the cochlear nerve is absent or severely deficient. So here's an example then of a small IAC and barely appreciable seventh and cochlear nerves. One other entity to be aware of when you see severe inner ear anomalies, if you should happen to see recurrent or persistent fluid in the middle ear space, some of these patients have uh, episodic deterioration in hearing where the etiology beyond the malformation is an abnormal communication between the perilymph containing inner ear structures and the middle ear space. This is known as a perilymph fistula, and these are typically tiny holes at or around the oval or round windows. And in these patients, there are typically two points of abnormal communication. One is through the IAC with a lack of normal internal structure of the uh, membranous labyrinth. And two is through this little hole around the oval or round windows, which essentially allows CSF to go from the posterior fossa into the perilymph space and out into the middle end mastoid. The fact that this is CSF can be confirmed by assessing beta-2 transferent. Now, we don't directly see the holes or the perilymph fistulas as a rule, but if you see a patient with persistent recurrent fluid in the middle ear and mastoid in association with a, an inner ear anomaly, then there's a greater chance that the surgeon will find a perilymph fistula at the time of surgical exploration, as happened in this case here. These patients are also at risk of labyrinthine, uh, labyrinthitis and labyrinthine ossificans. So, Moving on to cochlear hypoplasia, this is a term which is very loosely applied to cochlear anomalies and really should be reserved for a cochlea that is small and underdeveloped and usually has less than two turns. But in fact, nowadays, Dr. Senoroglu, who provided one of our earlier classifications, he has revised his classification and he talks about 
four different types and the latest type four is this latest edition which is a cochlea where there is a hypoplastic middle and apical turn and typically the middle and apical turns are also a little offset anteriorly. So this is a variant of cochlear hypoplasia that is a little bit more defined than the other forms as seen here, a little bit more developed should I say. Relevance of this is that many of these cochlear abnormalities will have associated hypoplasia or absence of the cochlear nerve. As you see here, here is a tiny single cochlear turn. Now, when it comes to the syndromes, life gets quite interesting. And I really like this recently published review by Felice de Arco and colleagues um, from 2020. And so we'll go through some of the entities that he has described in that article and we've also described in review articles in the past. The first we've already talked about is the baseball cap morphology as a sign of incomplete partition type 2 associated with the enlarged endolymphatic sac or large vestibular aqueduct as a manifestation of either Pendred syndrome or non-syndromic large vestibular aqueduct autosomal recessive inheritance with known underlying genetic mutations in anion transporter genes. We briefly alluded to incomplete partition type 3 with the bizarre corkscrew cochlea. This is much less frequently encountered than the preceding anomaly, but when you see it, you should be able to make the diagnosis, and it's a very important one to make because of the clinical implications. So this condition presents as X-linked mixed hearing loss or severe sensory neural hearing loss. So it occurs in boys. And the problem with this condition is that with the lack of internal structure, there is perilymph high drops. And essentially, you have CSF getting into the perilymph space very freely. And then if the patient has a conductive component of hearing loss and the surgeon attempts to do a stapedectomy, there is a risk of stapes gusher at the time of surgery or at the time of cochlear implantation of CSF gusher at the cochleotomy site. This condition also has a known heritable genetic mutation. Well, recently, you may have noticed in the um, 2014 article from Dr. Gong et al. that the findings have been well described on imaging, but more recently, um, there has been a report from 2019 by Atta Siddiqui and colleagues describing hypothalamic malformations in these patients with X-linked deafness. Well, we first noticed this entity in our institution in 2014, but because it's so uncommon, we were patiently waiting to uh, assess this condition, waiting for more cases so that we could write it up. And in the meanwhile, Dr. Siddiqui beat us to the punch. So here are some of our examples showing you these interesting hypothalamic hematomas. They shouldn't be mistaken for tumors in these patients with X-linked stapes gusha. Here is again the hypothalamic abnormality and the very characteristic any ear findings on MR. Notice also the rather wide internal auditory meatus, these malformed vestibule which is slightly globular and big semicircular canal with a large bone island here. And some of these patients will also be noted to have a peculiar superior protuberance of the vestibule extending up between the limbs of the superior semicircular canal. So the next, the third entity among syndromes, this is a condition where the basal turn is tapered and the middle and apical turn are too small. So kind of like center of glue's cochlear hypoplasia type 4, and as you look at the apical and middle turn, not only are they too small, but they're kind of offset anteriorly so that the interscalar septum between the basal and middle turn is rather broadened posteriorly. The other features of this condition are abnormal angulation of the IAC, a rather unusual posterior semicircular canal anomaly, and variable malformation of the external canal of the middle ear space, which is misshapen, of the ossicles, which are malformed and fused to each other, and then other features that you'll see are huge eustachian tubes, variable branchial, branchial apparatus anomalies, and sometimes renal cysts and renal abnormalities. So these are features of branchial otorenal syndrome. I call this the unwound cochlea. This is again a heritable autosomal dominant condition associated with an underlying genetic mutation. Okay, third amongst the, fourth amongst the important syndromes is this entity, which is charge syndrome. So 
charge consists of this constellation of findings, coloboma, heart defects, atresia coeni, growth and mental retardation, genital and ear anomalies. And when the diagnosis is made during infancy, so in infancy, if the patient presents with respiratory obstruction due to nasal abnormality, which in these patients is atresia coeni, most people immediately think of CHARGE syndrome as being the syndrome associated with bilateral coenal atresia. But interestingly, although atresia coeni is a major feature of CHARGE syndrome, most patients with CHARGE syndrome do not have atresia coeni. Instead, many of them have cleft lip and palate, bilateral or unilateral, and 100% of them have very characteristic inner ear anomalies. So as we look at these patients, these ones, they're diagnosed as having charge syndrome early on, but these patients, the diagnosis is often missed, and they come to clinical attention later because of craniofacial abnormalities or hearing loss. And then when temporal bone is imaging is performed, the diagnosis should be rel relatively quickly made. Typical feature is a small vestibule which has absent or rudimentary semicircular canals, and there's variable cochlear anomaly, most commonly mild flattening of the apical turn, but sometimes just a single cochlear turn is seen. These patients also have colobomata. And there are some other interesting features of charge. So compared with the normal, charge patients have pontine hypoplasia, they have variable inferior vermian hypoplasia, a very deep set pituitary fossa, malformation of the basi occiput, which appears variably hypoplastic or cleft. And then on MR, not only do you see the typical inner ear anomalies, but you'll see variable deficiency of cranial nerves seven and eight, components of eight, as well as the olfactory bulbs. Some surgical pitfalls to be aware of when assessing patients with CHARGE syndrome. One is many of them have jugular vein stenosis, and with that they have enlarged emissary veins, which course through the temporal bone. Many of them have poor mastoid pneumatization, so notice the very low dura of the middle cranial fossa overlying the external canal. And then almost invariably, these patients have oval window atresia, and with that aberrancy of the facial nerve canal, this is a tympanic facial nerve canal, which should be lying up here above the oval window, which is malpositioned and courses over the cochlear promontory. These patients also very frequently have hypoplasia or absence of the cochlear nerve and as seen here also round window stenosis. So if they are being considered for cochlear implantation, these are all very important considerations. So here is the review of some of the cochlear anomalies in various syndromes. The baseball cap of the SLCD26A4 mutation of EVA and Pendred, corkscrew cochlea of X-linked mixed hearing loss, the tapered basal turn and offset middle and apical turn or unwound cochlea, and as a manifestation of branchio-otorenal syndrome, and then the manifestations of CHARGE syndrome. Now, as we move on through sensory neural hearing loss, there's some interesting entities which are associated with malformations, most notably affecting vestibule and semicircular canals. So Vardenberg syndrome is a heritable condition comprising at least four types, and types one to three have variable pigmentary disturbances, including very brilliantly blue eyes, often of different colors, white forelock, white patches on the arms and legs, and sometimes uh, radial ray anomalies. Also these widely set eyes known as dystopia canthorum. But it is type four Wardenberg syndrome, which lacks these visual clues. These patients present with sensory neural hearing loss and constipation, and on imaging, the key finding is a rather unusual posterior semicircular canal anomaly. So it's a condition that radiologists can describe based on the imaging finding. It's rather unusual. Now, when it comes to anomalies affecting the vestibule and semicircular canals, we've talked about charge, we've talked about Wardenberg. Interestingly, children with trisomy 21, very common, as well as 22Q11 deletion syndrome tend to have malformations affecting the semicircular canals and vestibule with a small bone island and rather globular semicircular canal. And they also may have these anlager anomalies where the bone island is absent.
seen in both trisomy 21 and 22Q11 deletion. Since the horizontal semicircular canal is the last to form in fetal life, it is the one most frequently affected by malformation. This is a large and larger anomaly as will be seen in other syndromes such as Apert syndrome. Now moving on to patients with congenital unilateral hearing loss and other than those patients who are found to have enlarged vestibular aqueducts. This is another abnormality that we tend to see from time to time. And as you look at the imaging, either CT or MR, the first thing you should notice is this rather thickened dysmorphic appearing medallus and narrowed cochlear aperture. As you look for the cochlear nerve, it is absent. Here are three of the four cranial nerves in the IAC. So cochlear aperture stenosis and aplasia, the key feature is the narrowing of the cochlear aperture with or without medialar malformation as well as compared to normal. And there are a variety of cochlear aperture abnormalities that you can see ranging from complete atresia with aplasia of the nerve to milder degrees of stenosis with hypoplasia of the nerve to widening of the cochlear aperture as seen in some of the incomplete partition abnormalities. And we also see variable anomalies affecting the internal auditory meatus, which is considered narrowed if less than two millimeters in diameter, and this is associated with hypoplasia or aplasia of various of cranial nerves seven and eight com components. And this is an example of a severely narrowed IAC. And in fact, there was a separate canal for the facial nerve as seen here in a very narrowed cochlear nerve aperture. And here is the underlying syndrome. This patient has something known as pontine tegmental cap dysplasia, and this is the now recognized associated in the ear anomaly. So when it comes to sensory neural hearing loss at birth, we do see about a third to 50% of cases are environmental in nature and by far and away the most common and important consideration of causes is congenital CMV infection. Prematurity is also an important cause due to a variety of factors including hemorrhage, hyperbilirubinemia and hypoxia. So when it comes to inflammation, we see a whole variety of different causes of labyrinthitis ranging from viral as in CMV to bacterial, fungal, and even autoimmune conditions which are uncommonly encountered in childhood. This is an example of an abnormal prenatal ultrasound where you can see there is ventricular megaly and yet the head circumference was small. You can see abnormal punctate foci of hypointensity on T2 attributable to mineralization and a very disorganized cortical outline. So this patient had, high, um, had polymicrogyria and then as you look at the anterior temporal lobes, you can see what initially looks like prominence of the temporal horns, but as you look at the sagittals, you can see a little septum between the temporal horn and the cyst abutting the lateral ventricle. And so this is the typical anterior temporal lobe cyst, polymicrogyria and mineralization with a small head circumference and dysmorphic ventricular amygdala as characterizing genital CMV infection. And this is sometimes the only manifestation you'll see if you're doing CT of the temporal bone. So do be sure to look at your brain windows. So CMV infection, as shown here, has a variety of manifestations. And um, also notice the mineralized groups. Zika virus infection also causes deafness. So this is an example of proven Zika virus infection, not as frequently encountered as CMV, and with some overlap in imaging characteristics, periventricular cysts, mineralization, polymicrogyria, microcephaly, and so forth. And as mentioned, a hemorrhage, intracranial subarachnoid hemorrhage is a potent cause of deafness as well. The eighth cranial nerves are peculiarly sensitive to the presence of infection. So wrapping up then with um, labyrinthitis, this is an example of a patient who had otitis media and developed seventh nerve palsy and imaging showed petrous apex osteomyelitis and enhancement within the IAC with dural enhancement. This patient was ultimately diagnosed as having strep pneumonia infection and went on to develop florid labyrinthine enhancement. This is an example of um, tympanogen labyrinthitis. Ultimately, the patient lost the normal fluid signal and went on to develop florid cochlear ossification and progressed to complete sensory neural hearing loss. So when we think of pediatric labyrinthitis, most frequently, in fact, we see it accompanying meningitis. 
due to either meningogenic or hematogenous spread. And the phases on imaging early on, you'll see labyrinthine enhancement. And then over time, loss of fluid signal on the T2-weighted images. And ultimately, ossification, which typically starts as a slight thickening along the osseous spiral lamina, which then progresses, usually occurring first in the scalar tympani. And these children become very rapidly deaf, so if the surgeon is going to perform implantation, they should do so before the cochlea is floridly ossified. So imaging helps determine the appropriate timing and site selection. This is an unusual case of a cochlear implant patient who developed long-standing infection due to fungal infection, which eroded the petrous bone and caused labyrinthitis. We also see labyrinthitis as a consequence of trauma and then also deafness, sensory neural hearing loss as a consequence of trauma. And trauma in this situation is typically due to a severe impact in the AP diameter, sorry, the AP direction of the cranium, which results in a transverse fracture. And if you imagine the otic capsule bone is usually very hard and resistant to trauma, but when fractures do occur, and especially if they violate the otic capsule, then they cause profound and permanent hearing loss. These fractures tend not to heal because the bone lacks a good osteogenic response. And so over time, these patients are at risk of persistent CSF leak and or labyrinthitis ossificans. So this patient actually had a diastatic fracture and developed a perilum fistula and cochlear ossification. In conclusion, we have reviewed a variety of in-ear malformations. We have looked at examples of neonatal sensory neural hearing loss due to congenital infection, specifically CMV. We have reviewed labyrinthitis as a cause of acquired sensory neural hearing loss and looked at some interesting pathognomonic syndromes. Deficiency of the cochlear medialis has been highlighted as important in that it poses a potential risk of CSF leak at the time of cochleotomy. This is seen as a feature of IP2 anomaly as well as X-linked mixed hearing loss. Also, stenosis of the cochlear nerve canal is an important finding as it may reflect hypoplasia or absence of the cochlear nerve and subsequent failure of cochlear implantation. And this is a feature of CHARGE syndrome, trisomy 21 and other entities. And in conclusion, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And finally, to acknowledge some very important people who have helped me in my career, from Boston Children's Hospital, Department of ORL, Dr. Margaret Kinney and Dr. Dennis Poe, from across the way at Mass Eye and Ear, Hugh Curtin, and from all the way in Utah, Dr. Rick Hansberger. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Callie, for that beautiful talk and the beautiful voice and, of course, all that wealth of knowledge. Just incredible and amazing cases. Thank you, Callie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we will move forward to uh, my portion, which is just going over a quiz case that I had posted onto Twitter. And there were a few responses, so let's see um, if we can go over that. All right, I believe I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so here was my quiz case that I posted on Twitter. And at the time I did not state any history and I provided only one image. Um, so here is the actual history. 79 year old male with a history of left hearing loss, now an acusis. So here's the image and this was the one image I showed. So I'll let you take a quick look at it if you hadn't seen it on Twitter. But the findings essentially is that there is some haziness around the cochlea right here. So the question is, is it going into the cochlea? And this, this was actually raised by some of the tweets that came back about this quiz. Is it into the cochlea or is it just volume averaging? And then another note is that this hazy density actually goes all the way towards the round window. So things to be thinking about, pericochlear mineralization, especially if it goes to the round window, what entities might we think of? 
So yesterday we just ho hosted our T-Bone time, our third session, and uh, I referred to that a little bit. You can think about entities like otospongiosis, otosyphilis, which is um, inflammation and infection in the perilymph, and it produces an osteitis that goes around the perilymph areas. So it would fit with that, but the finding is sort of local in that area, at least based on this one image. You can have a uh, paget, which this does not look like. Um, you can have um, osteogenesis imperfecta, but this is an older gentleman and this is really not that extensive at all. And by now you would think it might be a bit more. And then to think about intracochlear mineralization. So the most uh, prominent entity you would think of would be labyrinthitis ossificans. Okay, so I kept, I did a video or a clip just to show the entirety of the appearance. So you can see that, oops, that actually there is not a whole lot of involvement elsewhere around the otocapsule. So there's not much around the semicircular canals. And the finding that we showed a little bit earlier around the cochlea, you can see again. All right, and the middle ear is clear. All right. So some more images. So if you look carefully, there actually is some hypodense areas in front of the vestibule, anterior to the region of the oval window, and the stapes footplate is thickened. So all those are very good for otospongiosis, and there are additional foci anterior to the vestibule, right there sneaking up towards the cochlea, pericochlear, and then here you can see it's definitely reaching up towards the round window area. But what f other findings are there? So a couple of uh, tweets that I got back did mention this. So another finding is that there's abnormal high density that's actually in the cochlea in the region of the uh, scala tympani. And also there's some hazy high density within the semicircular canal. And if you were astute earlier, as I was scrolling through, you will notice that there's actually a stapes implant and that is dislocated. That's going to posterior. You see that little dot and this coronal view is actually centered at the back part of the oval window. So to tie all of this together from the one image I showed, it's cochlear otospongiosis and labyrinthitis ossificans. The full answer is that this was a stapedectomy case done for otospongiosis, but there was an unhealing membrane around the implant, which led to an ongoing perilymph fistula and the patient eventually just developed labyrinthitis ossificans. So this patient started having hearing loss around age 18. He had a stapedectomy at age 35 and he heard well for a few days, but then had nausea and vomiting. So that could be an indication that there's a perilymph fistula leading to dizziness, vertigo, nausea, vomiting. So he went back for a revision stapedectomy two weeks later, but then completely lost hearing. Also some ancillary findings, stapes implant dislocation and um, People did mention high riding jugular bulb and this dehiscence between the jugular bulb and vestibular aqueduct, which may or may not have significance. There are uh, papers in the literature about it. It may, it, there's not a strong correlation necessarily with symptoms, but it is a finding that we do see. So I just wanna acknowledge the tweet facts that I did get um, and Lorenzo Pinelli actually did mention, well, is this otospongiosis? But I think there's also labyrinthitis specificans. And um, Dr. Karwacki mentioned that there is a high jugular bulb and the dehiscence. And everybody else provided bits and pieces of all the correct portions of the answer. So great job, everybody. Okay, so again, uh, I sorry. Again, there's just, um, here's the link to um, claiming the CME credit um, right up here. Um, in big print, so you can take a screen cap of that. And then here's the upcoming uh, slate we have. Last week we heard from Dr. Curtin, today Callie, and the next week we have Tabby and Debbie Schatzkes on sinonasal imaging and so on. So this would be great to put onto your calendar. And of course, we welcome members from all over the world. So um, it's on our website, ashnr.org. You just go to the bottom corner and there are all the links you need to get registered. 
And then finally, just a plug for our virtual meeting, which is happening. We're all so excited. And Alona Schmalfus did a wonderful job converting the um, physical in-person program to a fantastic virtual meeting program. So please do submit your abstracts. The abstract uh, site um, is open and the deadline for submission is July 10th. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Amy. That's a wonderful quiz and uh, thanks also for the details at the end. So we've had some interesting questions. Um, some of them are gonna be quite challenging to answer. So um, some of the questions you can view in the answered section of the Q&A that we've already been typing answers. Um, so one of them was, how do you distinguish between a perilymph fistula versus CSF otorrhea? And I think the answer to that is, it kind of depends on the mechanism and the site of abnormal communication. So for example, in the congenital cases that we talked about, there are two sites of communication. So one allowing CSF to get into the perilymph space and the second is a communication between the, the perilymph space and the middle ear space. So in that situation, you really have both. There are patients who have trauma with diastatic fractures where the fracture extends through OD capsule bone or through the tegmine tympani, and those fractures can be resulting in only CSF leaks, but obviously if they extend um, also through the OD capsule bone, then you can have a, a combined leak. So I think the answer is it really depends on the mechanism and on the site of communication. So there was another question about uh, uh, distinguishing between the two, um, and on imaging, Really the congenital type, we don't typically really clearly see the site of communication. Although for those of you who were at the temporal bone case conference yesterday, you would have seen Felice's case, which really did show you not only the inner ear anomaly and the fluid signal in the middle ear space, but also showed you abnormal widening of the oval window. And so again, indirectly, we, you know, that, that would be good evidence for a presumed PLF. So, you know, in terms of directly demonstrating them, there are some institutions who do perform CSF uh, contrast exams and try and directly show the leakage via those techniques. We don't tend to do that in our institution, but I know some places do. Um, Felice also had a question about um, why it is that the IP2 in Mondini occurs and Dr. Senora Glues postulated that it is due to abnormal pressure. So Felicia, I wish we had you live as a panelist. I'm sure you would agree that this is a very controversial topic and that if you try and seek it out in the literature, you'll see a variety of explanations ranging from uh, pressure effects to those where if you look at them, for example, the uh, vestibular aqueduct is not terribly enlarged and yet there's an IP2 anomaly. So whether it is on a basis of altered constituents of the fluid in the perilymph or into the endolymph space, or whether it's due to pressure effects, both of those have been postulated as mechanisms. Um, uh, there was a question about whether we use comb beam CTs. So I'll tell you, the most beautiful CTs that we ever get uploaded to our system are those coming from Mass Ionia, from Amy and Hugh Curtin's institution uh, in, um, hospital and they are comb beam CTs. And a while back when we explored getting a comb beam unit, um, the vendor that, for the unit that they were using said that they didn't have a unit in which kids could lie down and that the rotation took a bit of a long time for uncooperative patients. So we kind of relinquished the idea. In the meanwhile, there are newer units where the patient can lie down, but we uh, feel that we're kind of using our CT for multiple purposes. And so we've just stuck with our multi-slice CT. Um, Amy, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, at our hospital, we um, the comb beam CT scan time is very long. It's a sitting unit, and from beginning to end, it definitely it takes 10 minutes or more even, and the patient really has to sit very still. And in between, the techs are reformatting and doing different things, so um, we tend to not put pediatric patients um, to the comb beam scanner. And also on the other end, if we have um, elderly patients who cannot sit very well, um, because you know you would rather radiate once and do it and have diagnostic images, than try it by comb beam and then eventually have to go to um, the multi-detector anyway. 
Yeah, and then um, Gold Moon has asked a great question about what are, what are our thoughts on duplicated IACs and how do you distinguish from stenotic IACs? So yeah, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, so periodically you'll see extremely, an extremely narrowed IAC. And if you see an, a single canal, then I would call it stenotic. But from time to time, you'll see definitely two separate canals. They may be close by each other or they may be a little separated. And there, the loosely applied terminology is going to be a duplicated IAC. Duplicated and stenotic both. Um, I suppose what you call a canal really depends on what it transmits. And so I sometimes will refer to it, for example, if you've got a CT and an MRI or just an MRI where you can see facial nerve going into the more cephalad canal and then a hypoplastic vestibular cochlear nerve going into the other canal. I will tend to just call that rather than duplicated, I just call it there are separate canals with the facial nerve entering one and you know hypoplastic vestibular cochlea in the other. And so I think not to get too tied up on terminology, it's better just to really describe as accurately as you can what you see and what it's transmitting. And of course, if you only have a CT, then you just have to say I'm seeing two canals and look and see if the more cephalo canal connects up with what you'd expect to see for the facial nerve canal, in which case you can postulate that too. And Kelly, just on, um, on terminology, is the common cavity malformation same as cystic vestibulocochlear malformation? So that's, so yeah, that's another interesting question. Um, so I think the common cavity we referred to, so I think they use the term otosis for a tiny little round thing. They use the term common cavity for a slightly larger round thing, which you presume is going to be a primitive cystic structure with elements of cochlear and vestibule, though of course we don't really know. Um, and then if you go from that, the next thing in Senoroglu's classification is um, IP1. And so I feel that IP1 describes in lack of internal structure of the cochlea, the entirety of the cochlea, in a way that is disting distinguishable from IP2 and is different from the corkscrew morphology of IP3. But whereas IP2 and IP3 have known underlying um, potential genetic mutations, IP1 is just a descriptive term and doesn't allude to the underlying genetic mutation. I use the term cystic cochlear vestibular anomaly to describe something which looks like this. So it looks more like a figure eight, where I feel using the term IP1 is kind of, it's true, but on the other hand, even the cochlear part of the figure of eight doesn't really look like a cochlear, it's just a single globular cystic structure. And so that's the one where rightly or wrongly, I would call it a cystic cochlear vestibular anomaly. And really and just describe what you see and whether or not you see nerves. And the otocyst would be small? And yeah, I think that that is a small lesion, the small lesion. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then the one other thing I meant to say in my talk and forgot two other things. One is the Varnberg syndrome, the constipation is due to Hirschsprung disease. And uh, number two is I mentioned enlarged vestibular aqueducts in kids with the SLC26A4 mutation, but of course, you do get enlarged vestibular aqueducts in a variety of other syndromes. It often looks a little different. So the, um, the IP2 anomaly with large vestibular aqueducts, it kind of has a, a flared morphology, whereas Charge syndrome, brachioterenal syndrome, and Wardenberg syndrome, you'll see more I can't show you really, but a, a sort of funnel-shaped enlargement of the vestibular aqueduct. So also enlarged, but different in its morphology. Okay, any other questions? Very helpful alternative to CBCT is flat panel volume CT. Yes, from Dr. Pinelli, flat panel volume CT integrated in the angiography system, which you can acquire temporal bones, have have any of you any experience with that? I certainly have not. Um, Amy, have you? And uh, Jack, have you? Not flat panel, no. Yeah. I, um, there's discussion often um, hand in hand whenever there's cone beam discussed and flat panel um, it seems to be a good option. I think Felice may have mentioned that as well. Yes, 
Uh, Felice is also saying Odysseus often has no nerve. Absolutely. So that's the other thing, more important than terminology as to whether this is an otocyst or a common cavity. Otocyst is small, very primitive, often does not have an IAC and no nerve and is not an implantable entity. Um, so really that is probably the main distinction there. I have a question about the charge. You mentioned that there can be jugular vein stenosis and big veins. Mm -hmm. Do they ever get symptomatic with that, like pulsatility? So that's an interesting question. Um, the stenotic jugular veins, usually the ones that get symptomatic are when there's elevated venous pressure to a point that they develop ventricular megaly. And so as you'll see the same phenomenon in kids with syndromic craniosynostosis, um, some have the stenotic jugulars and somehow are somewhat compensated and don't become symptomatic, whereas others clearly go on to develop ventricular megaly and may end up needing um, shunting for hydrocephalus. So it's variable and it really depends on the level of venous hypertension and, and if they're able to develop really good compensatory emissary veins and which serve as conduits for the intracranial venous blood, then they may not manifest venous hypertension and raised intracranial pressure. The main problem with the large emissary veins is that they go right through the temporal bone and they're often quite anomalous in the course. And if they're planning to operate, the one thing the surgeon should be aware of is these veins are at high pressure. And in terms, if, if they try and, and cut them, <coughs> off, if they try and ligate them, um, then the patients have, there have been reports in the literature of catastrophic raised intracranial pressure due to inadvertent ligation of these emissary veins. So they're kind of between a rock and a hard plate, place. You don't want to interrupt the veins and cause bleeding, but equally well, you don't want to um, cut them off and end up having raised intracranial pressure. Mm -hmm. And Kelly, you mentioned um, IP2 um, in the setting of EVA. And um, are there any other syndromes? that you could see. Pendred was mentioned. Yes, so I kind of snuck that in for a second ago and um, Pendred syndrome, branchioodorenal syndrome, um, charge syndrome, Wadenberg syndrome, and a few others, definitely more funnel shaped morphology of large vestibular aqueduct. Um, Karen asks, she says she has a kid with hemifacial microzonia congenital external and middle ear malformation, but also an abnormal inner ear with IP1. Uh, she says, am I missing some syndrome here? So that's an interesting thing. So um, the problem with hemifacial microsomia is that it's descriptive terminology and as yet the etiology is unknown. Um, so um, there are certain radiographic features that enable you, or radiological features that enable you to diagnose hemifacial microsomia, but knowing that we don't have an underlying genetic um, abnormality, it's hard to know in all cases whether you're truly dealing with hemifacial microsomia or a lookalike. And there are some other syndromes which overlap in imaging with hemifacial microsomia. Um, and it's gonna to come to me, the one that I'm thinking of, but it has radial ray anomalies and hemifacial microsomia, like features with a lot of overlap in imaging. Um, but once you see inner ear anomalies in hemifacial microsomia and spinal vertebral anomalies, look for renal anomalies, then you might see inner ear anomalies, oval window atresia, that type of thing. And yes, I do suspect there are other syndromes that get inappropriately labeled as hemifacial microsomia, but they are few and far between. So yeah, golden haar is a phenotypic description. So hemifacial microsomia spectrum of anomaly includes a variety of different phenotypes. And when we see epibulbar lipodermoids and this vertebral fusion anomalies, then often apply the term golden haar syndrome. Some of the purists um, want us to use the, a blanket term hemifacial microsomia to describe all of them. Interestingly, if you speak to maxillofacial surgeons, they'll tell you that even patients labeled as hemifacial with you know, one side affected clinically often have bilateral asymmetric facial microsomia. So I think this is an area that is not well understood. And until we have a definable genetic mutation, I think we're going to see other things lumped in together with hemifacial microsomia that aren't in fact. Wonderful, fantastic. Uh, 
Are there any other questions we're missing? Uh, I had a question for Kelly. Um, yeah. Kelly, have you encountered uh, alterations in signal intensity within the enlarged vestibular or enlarged endolymphatic sacs in patients with uh, EVA? Yes, absolutely. We do see on MR, not infrequently, uh, uh, almost like a sediment level with um, brighter fluids, more ventrally and sort of more hypo-intense fluid on T2, more dorsally. Um, and that has, again, you look for explanations in the, the literature and it, it, there do seem to be some explanations in terms of altered constituents, but it is not a feature to be worried about. It is something that is known, recognized and acceptable to see. Uh, I just remembered the name. The other syndrome that looks like hemifacial microsomia is towns Brox syndrome. Um, those patients, you want to look for radial ray anomalies. So if you see abnormalities of radius and ulna and hands, in addition to what looks like hemifacial microsomia, then it's a known syndrome with a known genetic mutation and it's heritable, whereas hemifacial microsomia in most cases are not thought to be heritable. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? I'm just trying to see here, questions and answers. I think that more or less wraps it up. Yep, I think that's it. Well, thank you. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, and thank you, Callie, for all your time and expertise and for the great cases. And Jack, um, Christine, I don't know if you're still on. There she is. That was amazing, Callie. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful. And Amy, the case. I would like to say I got it all right, but you know, there you go. <laughs> thank you so much, all of you. It was just extraordinary. Jack, thank you for being here. Such an incredibly well-respected member of our society. Thank you so much for welcoming thank everybody. You, Christine. It's great. A lot of fun. Thanks so much to our participants. We really appreciate you joining us, especially those of you who are staying up well from the time. Great. See you next time. Very good.